I mean, my thought process was that, uh, you know, somebody's got to do it. Um, and I, but after rationalising myself, uh, well, there's no reason not to. I mean, what was strange was that nobody else was, you know, not so, so many other people weren't doing it. Not so much that uh, I was doing it. But uh, it, you know, it goes back to this thing, you know, you're not a spectator. You know, you can't expect other people, you know, if evil exists in the world, it's because good people do, do nothing against it. So, you know, the bottom line was that morally I had to do something. I had to be a participant, not an observer. I suppose that's, you know, the way I look at the world. I was born in Glasgow in 1946. I was one of the baby boomers, born in Glasgow and brought up in the sandstone canyons of Partick, which is a working class area of Glasgow. Um, I was brought up mainly by my grandmother, my grandpa to begin with, because uh, my mum and dad uh, split up when I was four or five. Basically, my grandmother was, um, who was a very important influence in my life. Uh, she was Presbyterian. My grandfather was Catholic, uh, although that was never an issue in the house. But it was always something that you were aware of in the streets of Glasgow. You know, religion was a very powerful force, political force, and social force. And uh, but, as I say, my grandmother, she came from a the Covenanting tradition, which is from, you know, the southeast of, of uh, Scotland. The, the Covenanters, who were quite, uh, as I say, an important uh, influence in my life, mainly through my grandmother. But I can remember one, on one occasion she took us to Wigton, uh, which is close to where she grew up in Srinrar, and she took me to the graves of the, um, the Wigton martyrs, now these were members of the, uh, the Covenanters who refused to take the oath of loyalty to, to the king. Uh, and uh, as a result, they were tried and sentenced to death and they were taken out to the Solway Firth where they were tied to stakes and then drowned with the rising tide of the Solway. But I always remember her taking me to see the graves of the martyrs and I always found that extremely, extremely moving. And I was also impressed with the uh, with the, the covenanting churches, which they don't have the altars at the you know at the end of the church, high on a, on on a platform or anything. The communion tables, or rather, are always in the centre of the church. So it's a very democratic um, type of operation and. Uh, 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 the way the, the way the actual church is, is, is run. The main thing about uh, being brought up in White Street in my grandmother's, my, granny, my granny's flat, was uh, I was always aware of what was right and wrong in terms of, you know, the people we played with, or even, for example, you know, discussing matters of religion, because there was a very strong sectarian uh, tension in Glasgow at, at, at that time, that still is today. Uh, but my grandmother was quite emphatic that, uh, that she would have no truck with orangeism or sectarian uh, hostility to Catholics, or and certainly as regards um, people of other nationalities. You know, she wouldn't brook any form of, of, uh, of racism. And whenever tramps came around asking for for food, she would always give them a bowl of soup and feed them on the staircase and give them some money as well. So there was that element of, of, of uh, Christian charity, uh, but a selfless Christian charity, not sanctimonious in any way, a genuine desire to help. And uh, so it, basically the framework was one of a highly moral framework of, with a clear distinction of, of what was right and wrong and the importance of doing the right thing. You know that we weren't spectators in life. We were actually here to, you know, we were involved in life, and we had to make a difference. I was uh, now living out in Blanta, which was a mining community, 
where there was a very strong tradition of um, uh, communist and anarchist and socialist, radical socialist ideas. But also the other very important uh, historical event that happened in relation to the mining community in Blanta was the Spanish Civil War. So I mean that was a real topic of conversation. In fact, uh, quite often, you know, on a Saturday night or a Friday night at the, outside the miners' welfare, there would be pitch battles between communists and anarchists over the role of, you know, the Communist Party in in in, in Spain in 1936. Uh, as I say, I met a lot of miners who had fought, who had gone out to fight, who joined the international brigades, or who joined some of the other militias. Uh, so Spain was quite an important moral touchstone for me. Miners would come back to Tam. Tam was the name my mother was, uh, the chap my mother was living with at the time. And uh, so they would come back on a Friday night and a Saturday night. And there would be these long discussions. And of course, I had really no idea what was going on. I mean, uh, these stories were quite fascinating. And also the ideas that they were talking about, because I was very interested in ideas, what moved people. Um, and uh, so the, the seeds were sown there. And it was, you know, I first came across the references to Karl Marx. So I started reading and I read the Communist Manifesto, which I found quite an inspiring document. I discovered that one of our woodwork teachers, technical drawings teacher, who was also a conjurer, by the way, and uh, he, I can't remember how I found out, but he was quite active in the Labour Party. And I remember asking him for if he could write me out the words of the red flag, which he which he did, you know. But he was really taken by the fact that I should, you know, as a 13, 14 year old, she'd be interested in the song of the red flag. And, uh, you know, things that we, we were talking about, he obviously picked up that I was generally interested in, in, in socialism. But this uh, technical teacher took me under his wing and uh, whenever he had, uh, had uh, you know, a free class, he would, you know, would always ask him to show some conjuring tricks. And of course, he would always use me as his, uh, his Debbie McGee. Well, we were hoping, because you know, there was a lot of things happening at the time. You had, uh, um, you had the Hungarian uprising in 1956. You had the East Berlin uprising. You had uh, the Cuban revolution. You had all sorts of things going on in Latin America. Uh, and so there was a real, and you also had the wake of the, um, where, you know, the beginning of the 50s, you had the findings of the Nuremberg trial uh, you know, in relation to what people's duties are when it comes to, uh, um, you know, your obligations as an individual in the face of tyranny, to resist tyranny. Uh, so all these things were going on and um, pointing me as well as a lot of other people of my generation, uh, turning us towards you know, radical ideas and we believed that the way that these ideas could actually be made flesh, implemented as it were, would be by bringing the Labour Party into power. Uh, among other things, I joined the Committee 100 as well, which was very much involved in the anti-war movement. And it was more direct action oriented than the CND, which was tended to be passive. So, I mean, the thrust of what I was doing tended to be towards uh, doing rather than uh, the administrative uh, passive role, which would be expected in most organisations, parliamentary organisations. I was outside the Mitchell Library in Glasgow and uh, there was a meeting, an outdoor meeting of uh, some of the members of the Glasgow Anarchist Federation. So I got chatting to them and we were talking and I suddenly realised that uh, um, for me anarchism was in fact the, the star that I was to follow. And it was there and then I actually tore up my Labour Party card, I can remember it quite vividly. After I became involved in the Glasgow Anarchist Federation, uh, I, I, you know, obviously we were involved in proselytising and selling leaflets and uh, holding 
public here, public meetings. But in terms of um, demonstrations, we were heavily involved in the anti-Francoist movement. And uh, as I became more involved in the anarchist movement, I used to go backwards and forwards to London, become involved with uh, you know uh, the exiled Spanish movement, particularly in in, in London. And uh, there I met the uh, members of the what they call the Juventudes Libertarias, which was the youth section of the Spanish anarcho-syndicalist um, uh, movement, the CNT. Uh, and these were the people who were heavily involved, in fact they were the only people who were involved in direct resistance to, to the Franco regime. They were involved in the, uh, in the armed resistance, the secret organisation <coughs> called uh, Defence Interior. Uh, so Defence Interior was an official part of the Spanish exile movement and its job was to organise, among other things, resistance to Franco and the attempts on Franco's life. So anyway, I, during one of these trips to London, I offered my services to people I knew who were members of uh, the Juventus Libertarius and who were also members of uh, Defence Interior. Anyway, I got a call, I said, uh, can you go to Spain? I said, yeah, so uh, come down to London and uh, we'll let you know when we're, when we're ready. I went uh, as I say, I was living, in London, living and working in London at the time, waiting for uh, the call to go to Paris, which came, went to camp Paris. Uh, and they, my job was to collect the explosives and take them to take them to Madrid, to pass them on to the person who, the comrade who would actually uh, carry out the, the action. Uh, and they, uh, which was an attempt on Franco's life at uh, Santiago Bernabeu football stadium. It's the Spanish secret police, the Brigada Social, had uh, infiltrated the movement and they were they were waiting for me. And uh, I was tried within two weeks and sentenced to 20 years prison. I mean, once you move into that area of direct action, uh, uh, you become dismissive of the, because because you completely distrust the nature of the state. You have to act according to your conscience rather than to the dictates of, of uh, uh, assigned by, by by law and by the state. Uh, so you basically have to follow your conscience rather than uh, the uh, the law. <laughs> 